and uh, <coughs> Tilo made also the move from from a little uh, German university hospital in, in Regensburg in uh, south of Germany and then coming here in this area and it seems like he will stay but sometimes I hear that um, Tilo and his business partner Jim there thinking over maybe to have a headquarter in, in Berlin and I ask you why why that so think, um, Tilo at that point also thank you very much for your 12 month support we um, started our pilot um, January 2014 in a lovely uh, Hillcrest um, new um, restaurant just to come together and uh, you organize some more partners here in the area and this is absolutely my philosophy always you need locals partners like an harbor so thank you for giving an update yeah thank you very much uh, Michael thank you very much for all for all being here it's quite uh, crowded at least <laughs> in this area here so thank you very much um, well, first of all, I think I have to lower your expectations a little bit because what I would like to contribute falls a little bit out of the framework of what we've heard so far, which is uh, for me quite uh, not only exciting but very, very breathtaking and overwhelming, including, of course, what's possible here as a product uh, as introduced by uh, Molecular Health. So the opportunity I would like to take is more about you know really going to a very smaller, much smaller space uh, of what we've heard about so far and this is more or less taking the freedom to talk about our experience, my experience as, as a new startup, as a German being here in the United States starting a company, uh, growing, uh, growing up in a, an academic environment and then making the switch to translation to, to uh, uh, the for-profit world. And um, so uh, first of all, um, I would like just to uh, give you a brief introduction to, uh, uh, into the company. Uh, if you allow me to do so. Um, so that's the name of the company. It's called Burl Concepts. Burl stands for Brain Ultrasound Research Laboratory. That's how I call my lab at UCSD. Um, maybe this is a very quick background. So I'm a board certified neurologist who came in 2002 to the United States. Uh, was invited to work on an NIH project here at UCSD. I started my lab and dedicated my time on using ultrasound technologies non-invasively for diagnosis and treatment of brain diseases. So that's where Burl is coming from. So what we do at Burl is a, uh, uh, Burl is a medical device startup which combines the um, expertise of uh, neurology, uh, ultrasound uh, research and technologies for diagnostics and therapeutics uh, in the brain and other parts of the body uh, and uh, to combine this with wireless technology. This is where my partner Jim um, uh, brings his expertise in besides uh, all the other contributions he made. Um, our main topic is stroke and um, as you know, um, also may know, stroke is a, is a very important disease. The time as brain is not only a phrase but it probably mirrors best what the problem is, is in stroke treatment. This is really the time issue. Other than in cancer, for example, time is of utmost importance and um, characterizes uh, the number of two million uh, brain cells dying every minute at the onset, after the onset of a stroke, practically characterizes best what the time dependency is in stroke. So there is no time to make a, a DNA sequencing beforehand, quite frankly, to, to get to the point. So um, it, is, uh, uh, it is a third common cause of death uh, in the United States. Uh, about 20, uh, seven, $27 billion are being spent in the United States just for stroke care on an annual basis. And um, when we talk about time and issue, you know probably, uh, or may I ask you, who, who knows somebody in your circle of friends, family, uh, who, who suffered from a stroke recently or some time ago? So that's a vast majority, uh, although we're not that many people uh, in this room. So it is, it is an imminent important disease. But if we look at it where stroke happens, it happens obviously not in the hospital. It have, doesn't happen at the practitioner office or your doctor's, uh, at your doctor's facilities. It happens at home, it happens uh, on a journey, it happens everywhere. But there's no tool nowadays for early diagnosis. So 
that is interesting because if you look, for example, at the website of the American Heart Association, you look for what is standardized today to diagnose and treat myocardial infarction, you find a list of at least 15 different items, including aspirin, the uh, administration of TPA for uh, trained personnel, nitro, and God knows what, 12 lead AKG is a long list. You do the same thing for the American Stroke Association, look for the standards which are acceptable for pre-hospital stroke care, it's a, it's a blank page. And that's where we would like to tap into. So the goal is, uh, with a device we, we call today the Burl device, to, uh, to diagnose stroke in ambulances and helicopters, preferably at the site of the emergency, means at the home, and uh, that's what we're after. So it's the second common, of, second common cause of death worldwide, and actually that's interesting because it surpassed cancer uh, within the last 10 years. So it's, it's right after myocardial infarction, the most common cause of death. In the United States alone, we see 800,000 new strokes every year. That means new strokes, not recurrent strokes. And about 2 million brain cells die every minute, so you can appreciate how long uh, how long it should take until, you know, early diagnostic and then initiation of treatment should happen, hopefully not hours, but minutes. So the status quo is we have nowadays, we have one FDA drug, which is TPA, which is worldwide standard to chemically reopen a vessel after it has been occluded by a blood clot. FDA is accepted everywhere, uh, sorry, TPA is accepted everywhere and it's, and it's a golden cow. And so on purpose, I would like to be a little bit cynical on this one. It's a golden cow because it's a lousy drug, to be honest. Lousy because it has an efficiency of, first of all, only 3% of all stroke patients worldwide are even eligible to get this drug, which is not much, obviously. From this 3%, only 30% really um, benefit in terms of reopening of the vessel. If we look at the long-term outcome, that means does this patient really do better than the patient who did not receive TPA? There is no statistical difference on the long term. We're not, looking, not talking about 30 days outcome, or 60 days outcome, but a year, two years, 10 years from, from the actual event. We have newer interventional methods like the Mercy catheters. These are truly catheters which are pulled through the vein, uh, through the arteries, and it's going all the way to the brain just to grab the blood clot and just pull it out. Very fascinating technology but it's invasive and limited, obviously, to some very highly specialized centers. So the costs are, as I've mentioned earlier, about $72 billion per year just in the United States, but there's no diagnosis slash therapy at the earliest time point possible. That means at the site of the emergency. So our mission is to develop and commercialize the world's first diagnostic device to detect stroke in the field and significantly reduce the global stroke burden. It sounds like a heavy word, but... Um, that's actually what we're looking at. And probably just to give you an image of what this device can do or should, should be able to do, take it like an EKG for the brain. That's probably uh, a, very, a very precise and close description. This is not how the device looks like, just to be uh, uh, honestly, and it has nothing to do with Russian roulette, what we're doing. It's truly science, evidence-based science behind. But what you might want to think of is a small device which is portable, which is battery powered. It's an ultrasound device which uses disposable transducers similar to EKG patches. Uh, our vision, that's the vision we've had about a year ago. Our vision now is like a head frame you put on your head, like headphones. Uh, obviously, you don't put the ultrasound transducers over the ear, but on the, on the temporal bone. But uh, um, it's, it's then being used with what we call microbubbles. This is an ultrasound contrast agent which is administered practically at any time. You go to a cardiologist, for example, you get an echo of your heart. The likelihood that you get this agent being administered to your veins is highly likely. So it's very, very much accepted worldwide. Uh, so there's nothing, nothing mysterious about it. The device uses wireless technology just to transpond the data directly to the hospital or to your own doctor or to your centralized data center to uh, do, for example, cloud-based uh, analysis of the data and use Bluetooth technology to actually communicate 
with your Bluetooth device. So what we envision is that our device is only practically a step stone which uses your Bluetooth device, for example, a tablet or an iPhone, which you then use as a user interface and to send the data to the right location. So the, the secret sauce we describe, um, we, we, we call it acoustic response analysis. So the simple thing is, like, uh, like in a submarine, you send out a wave to the tissue, you hit these little microbubbles which are floating in your blood system, you get a response from them, and depending on the response, you make a decision whether this is normal, or whether this is an ischemia, or whether this is a bleed. Now, throughout the development we've done, we, uh, we know that we can individually adapt the acoustic power, that means the voltage we apply to your, to your skull, because the skull characteristics between all of us is very different. You know, some need more, some need less. Bavarians definitely need more because they have, they're all boneheads, so you need more energy to get through and to hit the brain. Uh, but it's individually adapted with the technology we use. That means we never will exceed FDA-approved limits, for example, for diagnostic ultrasound. It can differentiate ischemia from bleed. That means simply two main causes of a stroke. Both are very important to recognize very early because they are, they are causing different cascades of further diagnostic and therapeutic treatment. So it's very important to have this information as soon as possible. What we've learned is, at least we get the information from our, from our experimental data, that the method will be able to monitor intracranial pressure, which is a big deal uh, in medical diagnostics nowadays, because right now, today, we do not have this method to do this non-invasively, but it is of importance. Yeah, we know, we, uh, due to our uh, and other studies, that the application of ultrasound without and with these microbubbles can enhance the microcirculation. That means the perfusion of the tissue improves. That, going back to stroke, means we could use this method to prevent further growth of ischemic areas. And uh, we have shown already, and that's my, my own work throughout the last 15 years, that ultrasound in combination with microbes can break up blood clots mechanically without a chemical effect and reopen vessels. So that's what we claim with the, with the technologies. This is just sim very simply how it looks as to give you an impression. So this is a very small vessel. It's a micro vessel. These are red blood cells here, and here you see a micro bubble. So this little fellow is able to expand and be compressed over time once we hit it with an ultrasound wave and this, the, the, the reflections that we're getting back are now being interpreted, such as here. So we know that certain signals, blue represents a signal pattern without microbubbles, red with microbubbles, and we know that there are certain frequencies we have to look at where we get only the signal from the microbubbles. So that helps us to decide, A, whether these microbubbles are on board. That means whether we are enough energy, we have applied enough energy, which is of importance because we want to keep the energy applied to the individual patients as low as possible. But we are able as well to say, okay, microbubbles are yeah, there, yes or no, means if a vessel is blocked, they're probably not there because this part of the brain is not perfused. Or if they are there, but they are their uh, amplitude is reduced. We know that they are there, but the pressure is increased in that area, which now dampens the reflected signal. So that's very briefly how it works. And this would be just a flow chart, how it would look like in the, actual, in the actual setting. So assuming we have a stroke patient here, 911 is being called, the ambulance, ambulance comes right away, picks up the patient. Now we have the paramedic who uses now the Burl device, um, which uh, should give uh, our estimate to get a diagnosis is uh, below 90 seconds, so probably a minute, minute and a half to have, have the diagnosis. But what happens mostly is that already at this time, the data is being communicated either with a receiving hospital or with a physician in charge, which could be, for example, the emergency physician. And at the same time, the data will be, will be fed to a central server for the data storage and further data analysis. So this would be a, a flowchart which would enable us, enable 
the medical community to diagnose a stroke, communicate it immediately with the hospital, and uh, prepare the hospital for further diagnostics or therapeutic preparations for that individual patient. It's practically the story of the 12 feet EKG, which happened 20 years ago. So that's, um, that's the technology. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, so we are now at the stage where we find out that both that the basic technology we described can be used with and without this microbiome, and for both we have a list of applications where this technology can be applied. So having a medical background, knowing that this, that this, that this concept improves perfusion of the tissue now lets you um, to write down the applications where an improved perfusion for a given tissue would be of benefit. It's a long list, and here are some examples. Well, that's about our product. Now, uh, I would like to switch the gears a little bit. You know, what excited me, what, you know, the opportunity I had to step out the academic world with everything I've learned from the academic world now to the, to the, uh, to the private world. So, one thing I would like to mention, and um, it's probably a little bit, you know, patchy here and there, but we are obviously a San Diego-based company, California-based company. But the team is quite international. So this is entire company. Um, we have Max from Austria, David from, um, from the United States with some German background. Uh, we have Arne, he's uh, from Norway, he doesn't talk too much like Norwegians do, but he's a brilliant engineer. That's myself and that's Jim who's with us. Uh, put a Canadian flag on it, although it's a little bit cheated because he's actually a US citizen, but still with a Canadian. Uh, pass well. <laughs> your duel. No, here we go. So it's it's quite international to begin with. Uh, these are these are the sources where we received our funding, and so we received funding from from the United States, from uh, local investors, from Canadian investors, which is which is Jim, but from Austria and Germany as well. In this is noteworthy, uh, I think, because it is probably a little bit different from other examples which are similar to us. Uh, and noteworthy as well because the money we receive from this size actually covers over 80% of our investments in the first round. Um, and uh, this is um, something which, uh, which I've heard talking to people in the field is not necessarily what you, what you would expect. Now that doesn't mean that um, uh, our friends and supporters, you know, uh, would not like to, uh, would like to uh, invest or would support the business. That's not what it means, but it shows a little bit to, to um, what it takes actually to have concerned citizens, people who are interested and would like to support an idea which they think is worthwhile supporting to get on board no matter if there is a transatlantic uh, Atlantic Ocean within between, yes or no. So, this brings me back to, and I just cannot resist just to mention this because it, it covered, uh, you know, 18 years of my own career, what the difference is between what I face now, what I face throughout the last one and a half, two years, and what actually the academic field gives you. So, this is the example, um, federal funding. So, uh, this, is my, this is a track record, so to speak, of my first NIH grant. So I applied first in March 2007. It was reviewed in, in October 2007, was declined. I had to resubmit it, did this in November. In February 2008, uh, it was reviewed again, uh, declined as well. well. Looked good, had a better score, but you still had to re resubmit it, which I've done a month later. Then it took about a year and a half until actually the decision was made that it's worthwhile funding. So, um, from here to here, we're talking about two and a half, uh, two point six years. I received a total of two point two million dollars in federal funding, uh, which included fifty six fifty six percent of overhead, which went straight to the university. That means I was left with now yeah, about a little bit more than one million dollar for a five year project. And um, this is the other story. Um, we started our company in May 2013, moved into the facility three months later. Uh, in November the same year, we started our R&D. 
and we started our first round of funding. Uh, in May, actually, we closed our first round of funding. We acquired about a little bit about $2 million. We were oversubscribed, but it took us actually less than six months to get this $2 million. In uh, October, we started actually the first animal trials. Now we're in the phase where we are approaching partners to develop the prototype, uh, where we establish our quality management system and where we're partnering now with a notified body for CE certification in this first phase because it makes most sense for us. And if everything works the way we think, it does. And with all you know, conservatism, we think we are realistically looking at October, November 2015, means this year, to have a first commercial product. So from here to here, two and a half years, same time point. Our estimate in terms of funding we, should, we would need to get to this point is probably about four and a half million dollars in total. Uh, but it has no overhead. So what's the main difference? The main difference is that within two and a half years, we started a company and have a commercial product. Here, within two and a half years, we applied for a grant and got it finally funded. So here, we just simply start with the work. Not, uh, uh, not, to, uh, not mentioned was uh, uh, it, that in this case, actually, funding cuts took place. So actually, we lost one year of funding. So it wasn't a five-year plan, but a one-year plan. And we have significant budget cuts, which led to a layoff of people. So this couldn't be more for me personally from, from what I've, from, from what I've uh, you know, experienced with the last couple of years, more, more black and white. How research, valuable research, and I'm simply be vain enough to include what we do as being valuable, could be differently supported. What are, the, what are the main reasons? So if we, if we look at these two, uh, two different sectors, if we look at federal funding such as the NIH and we look at the administrative monster we're dealing with, it is from today's standard absolutely unacceptable to, to spend three years, almost three years, from developing an idea and getting it submitted uh, spending probably uh, any time between three and six months to write such a proposal because it's a lot of input intellectually and what the research includes uh, specifically and then submit the whole package and we're talking about probably 60, 80, 90 pages of, of a proposal to wait half a year until you get the notification well it's not accepted. So what do you do? Do you go back the next day write a new grant? It's highly frustrating. And maybe I'm not a good researcher. I told my wife once that I'm not a good neurologist. She was the only one who believed it, but <laughs> nevertheless, I think we do good research. But what motivation is there if you work, if you give your heart and your soul in developing a good idea, making a huge effort to submit this grant and giving half a year later the notification, it's not, it's not done. So, and now we get into it a little bit more. The application process, this is what I've just described more or less, is a part of it. Why not, you know, giving a short proposal, submitting it, get it reviewed by the right people. I will uh, uh, get onto this uh, a little bit more later. Uh, and, and then get a feedback, okay, that looks good. You know, I would suggest to do this and that, and then you can submit a full proposal. Nine, it's always a full proposal which has to be submitted. So a very cumbersome application process. The review process is a, is a joke. Quite frankly, I can say this because I've joined many, many NIH reviews uh, and panel sessions, uh, uh, and I, that's, that's, um, that's the idea I came home with. And why is that the case? Because the people who are reviewing your research or making a judgment whether your research is valuable, yes or no, are the same people who do the same or similar research you do. These are researchers. Researchers now judging researchers whether they're doing good work. So if you're working in a similar field I work in, or if you're a researcher and you're depending on grant funding, what's your incentive of giving your vote that I will receive $2 million for my research where you could probably have it or your partner could have it? So this whole system does not make sense at all to me. Uh, it should be, should be massively changed, and uh, we can talk about this in a minute. Budget cuts, obviously, here in the United States, we face this throughout the last couple of years, are absolutely evident and, and are, are a killer 
of academic research. And since I stepped out of my own lab, which I closed in March last year, I know at least of four labs in my vicinity, neuroscience and radiology UCC, which had to close their shop because they were running out of funding. So, the structures, in essence, are completely archaic. And if it, if it keeps continuing like this, I don't see any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, hope for you know, good science, good research, uh, good, good research uh, innovative ideas, whether it's biotech or medical development or whatever, uh, to really take off and to, to, to bring it to the, to the community and to the people who really can, can take it and make, it, uh, you know, and make, make use out of it. So, this is something which I have experienced in the United States, and it's not different uh, in Europe. Uh, and I have my contacts, my networks in Europe and Germany as well. What I hear has nothing changed since I've left. So this is not the way just to take it off. So I've been, of course, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, loosey woozy and say, okay, in the private sector, we don't have all this. It's very straightforward. And why is it the case? Well, I like to say it's because of the concerned citizens. So there's no administrative part which tells you you do a good job or you don't do a good job. So people you talk to and which I, what, I, what I did not, which I, which I, which I did not tell you is, um, is uh, we have here, when we started the company in May 2013, go, we go one year back into May 2012. That's the time point where the patent was filed in October. Uh, a patient of mine made a brilliant video, which is now displayed on YouTube, describing the, uh, um, the, the, the concept. In November, uh, I met a lady who invited me to uh, a private institution to give a talk. At that talk, or at that event, I met another brilliant, wonderful lady who introduced me to a group of people here in San Diego. In December, I was supposed to meet Jim for the first time, which did not take place because his mother suffered from a stroke, so we met in January. Uh, um, in March, he proposed um, to, to start the business, which then was taking place in, in May. So one year from filing the patent until having a company. Well, if that's a normal case, if that's happening all over the place, I don't know. I like to see that this is something which shows that it does not take necessarily all the structures we we, we, we need uh, all the, sorry, all the structures we know, like the FDAs, like the DFGs, like the professors or the institutions all over the place to make things happening. And uh, there's a whole lot of, of, of resistance of changing the established systems. And uh, to be very honest with you, the one reason why we chose to develop a diagnostic system is not necessarily because Obviously, we think that diagnostics of strokes in the field is important. The whole idea, the whole concept was based on treating strokes already in the ambulance. But I know for sure that if we go out and propose exactly that, we can close the shop tomorrow because the community will, t will tell us, you're completely out of, out of your mind. You're taking away our business. Business is way too big to get somebody like you growing up or this idea growing up, we're not gonna do this. And I got more than one proof that my theory is right. So, um, in this sense, um, uh, the questions are actually what, what, can be, what can be done? What are examples which are now available where you know, a better communication uh, can, be, can be offered? And, existing structures can be broken up. I just want to mention uh, this institution which we are affiliated since a, couple of, uh, since a couple of months actually, since October last year, it's the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center. So what's, what's the story behind? I find it, found it to be fascinating. There is an academic center which is linked to the School of Engineering, in this case at the UC Berkeley. This center now has its main focus to foster Academic international, uh, sorry, uh, academic industrial relationships. How does it work? The academic center says we offer all our new ideas, our new projects, our research, we our we, we our intellectual property, and open it up to everybody who might be interested in. We invite people from the community. We invite industrial partners 
to join us, to, to take a look at what we have, offer them our IP, and, uh, and um, what we are asking for to do that is a membership. So, companies like Qualcomm, Siemens, Philips, big companies, small companies like us, are joining now this, uh, this center with a great benefit to have a, a biannual update what new developments are taking place right now at the University of Berkeley, which is one of the leading centers in engineering. Uh, in the States and have a, have a practically an exclusive right uh, before IP is being published to take, to take a hand on that IP you might be interested in. You pay a membership for this and if you want to do more, if you want to have a dedicated project, you, uh, you would like to see develop, being developed at that university in this center, you, you pay a higher uh, membership fee. But uh, it is, it is, uh, it is a, a very nice combination for startups like us. So what that means is there are 65 members in this center and uh, memberships are differing, a a different, a differing between 55,000 the low end and $135,000 per year. But uh, with this combination, the center makes about $4.2, $4.3 uh, million dollars in constant revenue every year completely independent from federal funding. So that's a brilliant combination how, how this interest could be, how, in, how this interest could be matched. So uh, coming back to uh, the bridge between the United States and Europe, and of course, you know, you can make this rather, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, how shall I say, a rather powdery story of a German taking the opportunity to come into the United States, make an academic career, building a great company with great support from the community, uh, uh, and, uh, and now is taking the um, idea back to Europe, and now we close our shop here, and now we start a business in Germany. That's not the way it is, but the fact that European funding in our case comes into shows me that as much as we see this amazing support from concern, of concerned citizens here in San Diego in the area, we have, we have the same phenomenon in Europe. Because the people who support us from there don't do this because uh, we are friendly people. There is, there is an incentive behind, and it's not necessarily money-driven. So these are ways, um, uh, I think, uh, or this could be an example how, due to uh, personal communication, having ambitious people, passionate people at the same table who are interested in, in a certain topic, networking like Micha is doing with his, um, uh, with his uh, foundation could really open up new, new avenues how uh, relationships could be built up and uh, potentially build up to, uh, to, the, to the benefit of, of all participating parties. And this is a, uh, this is a quote, it's probably not correct, uh, but at least the sense is. We've had a meeting with Joe Panetta, the CEO of Biocom, two days ago, and when we talked about you know, Berlin and our ambitions and, and what we want to do, he said the technology transfer from Europe to the US stops in Boston. What he means, and this probably has nothing to do <laughs> with your move to Boston, I assume. But what he means actually that there is a little bit of a disconnect that a lot of technology uh, from the European point of view happens to be in, in at the East Coast and should stay there. And a lot of, a lot of um, technology or VC um, uh, uh, exchange does not even reach the West Coast where we are. That might be true, might not be true. I think it found it, I found it interesting to, 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 to hear from from, you know, from, from somebody like, um, like the CEO of Biocom that this seems to be a, a view how, how the communication between the states uh, for you know, biotech VC and biotech technology transfer seems to be between um, the US, especially the West Coast and, and Europe. But with this um, being said, um, I actually already <laughs> come to the end of my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> now I know that it is, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> not, we still have plenty of time, so. No, totally. <laughs> I got a question regarding doctors, physicians in general. They tend to be 
Well, sometimes a little hesitant. So you have the vanguard and you have those who put out a restraining order. We heard that from uh, Friedrich von Bohlen earlier. And um, you mentioned TPA, the drug that's pretty much the, the standard right now, the clot-busting drug, which you called, I think, a golden cow, something like that. Do you expect um, resistance from physicians once, once you really approach them, or have you already experienced some sort of resistance or hesitance or even hostility? You mean with regard to the product we developed? Uh, for the product, exactly, because that's dramatically different from what's sort of the standard therapy right now. Yeah, I give you, I give you one example, which I think it's just remarkable. I, I, I really like it. Um, to, to the best example to show you how, how predictable the, the thought patterns of physicians is to use a certain widely accepted drug for that purpose, in this case for treating strokes, is that if we go back, let's say 10 years ago, and you would have talked to a physician, a neurologist, a stroke neurologist, and, and uh, would have told him, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna develop a method to, to, to treat strokes, uh, diagnose and treat strokes in the field the immediate gut reaction would be would have been okay what well, well, can, can you give tpa in the field and say no we can because you know there's no ct and so forth so that was a perception 10 years ago that it's still this perception shows you that the efforts were even made to build a gigantic truck with a mobile ct scanner and a clinical lab which is now touring around the charité in berlin to do exactly that you may call it, you know, amazing, you know, amazing technological advancement of making this happen, which is probably true. But coming back to to, to Micha's uh, relationship to fur, on fur, nobody would benefit from this gigantic truck. Besides the fact, mine affected across 1.6 million euros, needs six people permanently and staff on it. But this is this example shows beautifully. Again, a little bit cynically from my point of view, but it shows you beautifully how how um, how you know how, how stubborn and and narrow-minded, from my perspective, the view is how medicine should be involved. It's not the thought of what can we do if we do not have TPA on, in place. No, it's a thought of what can we, how what do we have to do to build something around so we can give TPA in these scenarios. This is, um, I think, it's for me a good example to show the mentality or the, the, the thought pattern. Well, <clears throat> thank you for bringing up this Berlin example because, uh, it, sorry I adjust only because I, um, this is a lovely entrepreneur who had this idea and you know him and uh, so um, now we will have then in Berlin two of these trucks and then um, somehow they achieved I don't know if it was red wine, beer, something else. So there are even um, German healthcare insurance somehow behind say, oh, this is a very proper new system. We should involve now us to support the payment. And uh, because the costs are not having the truck. If it's one million, two million, no. It's a running system. It's a running system. And um, what, what I'm, I'm very keen to see in, in your upcoming company as a solution company for diagnostic and then later on therapy of stroke, I see what I've learned so far. You're involving yourself as entrepreneur with medical special background in neurology and the whole process chain. And so... Um, so to say, if you have only this truck solution, which is rolling CT, I see in your device development, which is also, also de software development, the implementation connection with the whole um, patient through therapy channel. So, um, as we were discussing this many times, you, you're involving in a whole network which is the chain of diagnostic and treatment by specialist. And this is probably also a new way, you are more in the medtech field, but I guess it's also correct for the biotech field as startup company to consider the whole chain of process for the patient and to be part of it and to look 
that your device and then at the end has a good value-based outcome which we can measure. But sorry, I, I was too fast. Yeah, Tulo, I, I may have misunderstood the uh, response to the question over here about <coughs> the TPA and, and the use of your device and whether there would be a pushback by the TPA community, the, the manufacturers, to the use of your device. <coughs> I view your device as complementing TPA in that you don't want to give TPA if the stroke is a bleeding stroke versus a clot-based stroke. And so <coughs> the, the fact that, that you can remove, it de-risks the use of TPA to an extent, is my understanding. No, I completely agree with you. This is, this, but this is, I think this is not, not in, in dis disagreement with what I've, what, what I've said. I I'm completely agree. It's, it's an add-on. In, in fact, you would very much like to see, or I could envision, that you use this device once a patient has not been administered to the, uh, to the ER and now goes through his CT, MR, the device will be CT compatible so that you really use it on speed. You can even use it to prepare, uh, you know, patients who, because a lot of, mainly the patients who get neurointervention already failed the TPA uh, systematic therapy. So if you now have a, ther a therapy which combines or adds on the ultrasound to the TPA, you might now have a huge success in the neurocatheterization of, of uh, uh, embolectomy. Yeah, and, and your, your device really gets to the heart, no pun intended, of the timing, the duration, 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 the duration,
affordable device. Now, how much that matches to the topic of personalized medicine, it's a different story. I think it's too early. But what Jim said, the idea is that you use your Bluetooth capable device as a user interface. You upload the, the software, then you just have a, a very small add on piece, such as a head frame, and that's your medical personal device, however you want to call it. Yeah. Excellent. So, I saved a lot of time. <laughs> so, in this case, uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Wow.